Well, good morning, everybody. I want to thank everyone who is joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Brent Fuel, and I'm with Conserve America, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's uh, webinar on an exciting topic, um, uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, uh, legislation that is pending in both the Senate and the House, and that, if adopted, would provide uh, $1.3 billion for wildlife conservation and restoration. Uh, there is a growing sense of urgency in this country to improve the way we as a nation approach conservation and protect biological diversity. While there are over 1,600 species listed as either endangered or threatened in the U.S. under the Endangered Species Act, states have identified more than 12,000 at-risk species requiring conservation and monitoring. Absent more and better conservation, many of these spe species could soon be added to the ESA list. Recent studies indicate that there are significantly fewer birds in the U.S. compared to 50 years ago. As a, a bird watcher and enthusiast, that's obviously troubling to me. Uh, grassland species are increasingly at risk. According to the North American Breeding Bird Survey, birds like uh, the nighthawk have experienced declines by 60% nationwide since the mid-1960s. The cause of the decline for many of these uh, at-risk species is all often multifaceted, but habitat destruction, fragmentation, and modification are often the leading causes of decline in the U.S. The question then remains, are these trends reversible? If so, what can we do? Would uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act give us a chance to go on offense, being more proactive to manage at-risk species and keeping species off of the ESA list? We have a great lineup today of distinguished pro professionals who will help us answer these questions. Uh, but before introducing our panelists, a quick word about Conserve America for those who may be unfamiliar with us. Uh, we are a conservation organization dedicated to promoting pragmatic solutions to our nation's energy, environmental, and conservation challenges, uh, advocating for market-based solutions and meaningful, sustainable regulatory reform. Today's webinar is part of our monthly webinar series aimed at promoting impactful engagement on important policy issues affecting our shared environment. We are fortunate today to have Colin O'Mara, president of the National Wildlife Federation, Sarah Parker Polly, who serves as the director of Missouri's Department of Conservation, and Amos Eno, president and founder of Land Conservation Assistant Network. Uh, we've agreed to dispense with the uh, lengthy bios and presentations this morning. Um, and what I would encourage our audience to do, if during today's discussion, any of uh, you have questions, please feel free to send them uh, to us in the chat box and we will get to them as we can. So let's jump into the discussion. I wanna direct the first question to, to Colin. Colin, the, the, the bill has been floating around uh, and the idea has been floating around for several years, but there appears to be a, a fair amount of momentum this year with a considerable bipartisan support. For those who may be less familiar with uh, the legislation, you know, why, why should people care and pay attention to this? Uh, thanks, Brent. And, and thanks to the Conserve America family. Um, it's really great to be with all of you. And thanks everybody for jumping online today. I see folks are, are busy and it's a, kind of a crazy day on the Hill today. So I appreciate everyone that uh, made time for it. Um, like the idea here is fairly simple that, you know, America has done a, a incredible job saving the species we hunt and fish, um, but hasn't been able to apply the same kind of well-worn best practices to the full diversity of wildlife. And right now, about one third of all species are at heightened risk of extinction. States have identified more than 12,000 species of greatest conservation need. And yet the congressionally mandated state wildlife action plans um, that were you know, part of a, a package about 20 years ago um, to try to have more money going to uh, species in the, in the small state wildlife grants program um, only fund about 5% of the work that's needed. And so in the years ahead, um, if we don't take preventative action, this is very much predicated on the idea that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, that if we don't do that, you know, kind of preventative medicine before we wind up in the emergency room, we could see thousands upon thousands of species being listed, billions and hundreds of billions of dollars of costs on the private sector, you know, tens of billions of costs, tens of billions in costs on the government um, to save species that would frankly be a lot cheaper to save now. And, and so, you know, this idea of trying to do something proactive that's you know, collaborative and voluntary, that's at the state level. Um, so it's not you know, federal regulatory, it's kind of state collaboration being the mechanism as well as with territories and with tribal nations. Um, but this idea that we can do it better together, that by, by having folks collaborate and work together through voluntary proactive actions, it's a better way to save these species that we deeply care about 
before we have, you know, kind of a, a regulatory train wreck that, you know, if we had to list you know, thousands upon thousands of species that are on the brink of extinction. Well, we can all support the idea of uh, voluntary and, and, and partnerships as opposed to, to, to more regulations and hopefully we can, we can stem the tide. Sarah, you're on the front line um, of protecting and conserving these species at the state level. You know, what is, um, maybe from your perspective, um, you know, what does RAWA, if it is adopted, what does it mean uh, for, for Missouri? Brent, that's a great question. And again, just as, as Colin said, thanks so much for the opportunity just to visit about this incredibly important topic for our states. And I, I wanted to hit on one of the statistics that Colin noted is that currently uh, only about 5% of state wildlife action plans uh, have the ability to, you know, to be implemented just because of, of limited funding sources. So, you know, states have their state wildlife action plans. Uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, state wildlife action plan here in Missouri that we are ready to utilize once, and I do say once, Recovering America's Wildlife Act passes. Um, we have something called a comprehensive conservation strategy where we've already been working with partners, including our federal agency partners, um, NGO partners, have identified of our, uh, our COAs, our conservation opportunity areas, what are those priority landscapes or what are those priority geographies? And so uh, with additional resources going to those uh, priority geographies, it also protects all of the species uh, that depend upon those landscapes. So we have, Brent, we're ready. We have a Rob Ready Missouri plan where we are looking at at first implementation about 50% of those additional funds. And for Missouri, it would be about roughly $21 million annually. Wow. That about half of that would go to additional habitat restoration projects, which would benefit both terrestrial and aquatic uh, species of, for us, of course. And then about a quarter of that would go for additional fish and wildlife efforts and then we would split the remaining between uh, education efforts, uh, potentially some conservation easements, uh, some additional land protection efforts. So we are ready uh, and we can leverage those funds, you bet, here in Missouri to do a lot of additional work. Now, all that additional work, and that's very exciting, Sarah, all that additional work, obviously is gonna take more bodies. Um, so, you know, would this money be go to hiring additional staff to, to implement the, uh, these plans? That's my number one question that my staff ask who are feeling already <laughs> overtaxed and worn out and saying, promise us that this will mean additional right. boots on the ground. And of course it yeah. will. We're already beginning the planning now. And we know that, you know, first things first, let's know how we're gonna uh, spend the monies and have some planning in place, but uh, you better believe that uh, to get, a, you know, we've got to have additional boots on the ground. Um, you've mentioned the 12,000 species. We've got over 600 species of uh, greatest conservation need here in Missouri, plenty of work to be done, but it will, I mean, and it's going to mean additional money for cost share for our private landowners. It's, it's going to mean additional monies likely to partners, but ultimately uh, for what we need to do, both on public and private lands, it's going to mean additional capacity here at the department. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's great, great information. And you mentioned uh, private landowners. Um, Amos, I wanna bring you into this conversation. You've spent better part of your professional career advocating for partnerships with private landowners and the, the value of, of, of these landowners and, and uh, being being part of the solution. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, some of the work that you've been doing? Yes, thank you, Brent. And first, I want to compliment Colin for his leadership on this issue and Sarah for the role of states because states represent the majority of boots on the ground and expertise. But when you think about uh, private landowners and their importance for conservation, I mean, it's 80% of the equation. 82% of the wetlands in this country are on private land. 80% of the endangered species habitat is on private land. And this is you know, not understood generally, but I mean, if you go back to Aldo Leopold's writings in the 1930, he wrote, the geography of conservation is such that the best land, most of the best land will always be held privately for agricultural production. So the bulk of the responsibility for conservation 
thus necessarily devolves upon the private landowner, especially the farmer. And that's truer today than even when he wrote it. Yeah, that's uh, Aldo Leopold's one of my favorite, uh, uh, favorite authors, one of my first books in, in uh, wildlife management to, to read the, the Almanac. Um, I'm going to throw this out to, to, to whomever. Um, obviously, Amos uh, raises the important role of, of, of farmers in agriculture. Can, you know, is there an opportunity and are we seeing uh, the agricultural community more engaged on these issues and becoming, you know, partners uh, on, on, you know, greater, greater partnerships on, on conservation? Brent, I'd love to answer that question here in Missouri. Um, we have an entire branch of our agency devoted to private lands work because Missouri is about 93% of our uh, ownership is in, is in private ownership. So we simply can't uh, accomplish uh, our mission without a, an incredibly close working relationship with our agricultural community, which we have you know, spent the better part of 85 years uh, developing. But we currently have a number of cooperative positions where we actually provide the funding to ag partners, such as Missouri uh, Soybean Association, our corn growers, MFA, uh, university extension, uh, over 20 uh, positions, boots on the ground, who serve as that connection, that liaison between the agency and that private landowner, especially our ag producers, to uh, really promote our, our conservation-related programs. And so sometimes we think it's it's better to have maybe a face that they're more familiar with, that they work uh, mm -hmm. with more day in and day out. Right. And uh, it's really helped us to leverage those conservation efforts. Colin, um, obviously there's a fair amount of bipartisan support for this. You know, we see all the rancor and the gridlock in Washington. So we're, we're you know, many of us are optimistic that, that uh, we'll be able to put, a, put aside those partisan uh, uh, arguments and, and, and push forward on this. There are some Republicans who obviously have some reservations about the, the, the bill. Um, obviously in, in spirit, they you know, support it in concept and spirit, but there's concerns about how we pay for it. 1.3 billion uh, is, you know, is, is, is a fair amount of money. Although when you talk about 3.5 trillion uh, reconciliation package is obviously it's a small drop of the bucket, but uh, um, talk to us if you will about, you know, if there's a chance, understand there obviously there's a markup this week, tomorrow in committee, if there's a chance to, to work through and work out some of those concerns. Yeah, no, I appreciate the I appreciate the question, and you know, I think the the level of bipartisan support, you know, is is pretty remarkable, right? I mean, at, at this point, having you know, fourteen Senate Republicans, fourteen Senate Democrats coming together, you know, folks like you know Senator Blunt and Senator Tillis and Senator Graham and Senator Bozeman, and, and I can go on and on, um, on the and and then you know teaming up with you know Senator Heinrich and and Senator King and you know the the whole team, and then on the House side, you know, we've, I think we're at twenty nine or thirty you know House Republicans, and so. Um, that level of bipartisanship, unfortunately, doesn't exist in many areas. But you know, I feel like uh, all of us working together is build, are building a pretty good track record. And this is the same kind of coalition that got the Great American Outdoors Act done. Mm -hmm. Last Congress, under the leadership of Senator Daines and Senator Gardner and, and Senator Alexander and Senator Portman and so many others. Um, Senator, you know, I think the the, uh, the the case on the case on the on the business case, and I think you know, I think, and Congressman Fortenberry, who's been the the leader on this since the beginning, um, I think says it best. Is that you know this this idea of that collaboration um, is both the both the most cost effective, but also the, the least painful way to achieve the outcome. And that we're really replacing a system that's too often defined by regulation and litigation with a system right. of collaboration to do more collaborative conservation, and and that that's the model. And so um, the one innovation in this bill compared to previous iterations is that uh, Senator Blunt uh, had the the brilliant idea of dedicating. Um, non kind of undesignated penalties and fines and, and different environmental um, revenues that come in that, that aren't really in the baseline. Um, they're not really scored right now because they're not predictable. Um, but if you look over a 10 year window, there's tens of billions of dollars there. And so similar to the Great American Outdoors Act, which used kind of an increase in oil and gas revenue and, and, and mining revenue, um, this is using an existing source, which is you know similar to the way Pittman Robertson was, was done when we took an existing excise tax on munitions and firearms and applied it towards conservation back in 1937. Um, but it's something that doesn't actually increase the deficit or increase the debt because it's money that isn't as 
um, isn't currently kind of part of the, the baseline of the scoring. So it's a, it is a, it's a, it's a good offset. And I think the other part of the equation that's increasingly attractive, um, when folks start thinking about the cost of inaction, I mean, right now, you know, the numbers show that it costs over $19 million on average every, to the government every time a species is listed. Um, and, the, and the estimates are that it's four to five times that in the private sector. Um, so, you know, 80 to $100 billion, 80 to $100 million of cost per species. And, you know, we all know the spotted owl examples of, you know, tens of billions of dollars or, you know, other ones that are much greater. Salmon obviously has been expensive. Um, but that ounce of prevention, I mean, if we can, if Sarah's team can save a species in Missouri or, you know, our friend Eric in, in Florida or, you know, the team in, in West Virginia or other places can save a species for a few hundred thousand dollars of strategic investments and leverage financing with partners, you know, especially working with the private landowners, the way Amos said, um, we can avoid a whole world of hurt on the, on the back end. And so, you know, we, we think that this, you know, this investment of $1.3 billion a year is going to save five to 10 times that easily. Um, every year in, in, in going into the future, because the, 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 the model of only having a regulatory tool um, as, the, as the backstop has just proven to be an incredibly expensive, incredibly contentious way to try to save species. Yeah, it absolutely is. And as one who, you know, over my lifetime has advised corporations on endangered species and kind of the disruption to, to business in the local economies, as we've seen, uh, I would agree with you. Trying to avoid those listings is just absolutely essential. So, Amos, I think you had something you wanted yeah. to. Brendan, during my years at National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the last five years, I did 140 grants to keep species off the list. Every single one of them worked. Um, so, the cost prevention is enormous. Uh, we also set up um, a situation of using um, penalty monies for funding conservation at NIFWIF. And that's been extraordinarily successful for decades. That's great. Yeah, no, Amos, you've been a real champion over the years of, of advocating for those partnerships with, with landowners. So we have a couple of questions from, from um, our audience. Uh, Lib Tidwell asked, how frequently are species added to the endangered uh, species list? Colin, you're on mute. I think I'd figure that out after 18 months of this insanity. Um, <laughs> so, hey, Liv, um, uh, I mean, like right now, so right now there's more than 1,600 uh, species in the U.S. that are under, that are listed in the Endangered Species Act. Um, that rate is escalating, um, and it's, you know, kind of across parties. Um, obviously, they're kind of added faster in certain administrations. But, I mean, right now in Florida, um, there's more than 60 animal species listed, another 60 um, plant species listed. And this is everything from the manatee and some of the sea turtles to you know, fairly small aquatic fish in some of the systems. And so one of the brilliant pieces of this bill that you know, came out of the negotiations um, with Congressman Fortenberry and Debbie Dingell was to have 15% uh, of the money dedicated towards recovering species that are already listed. Um, a lot of those species, with just a little bit of investment could come off the list um, and then obviously create more regulatory certainty. And then also have 10% of the funding dedicated towards innovation and try to encourage folks to work across state lines or across, you know, with different kinds of partners trying to, trying to get species back. But you think like in, in, in Congressman Mass District, you know, like all the issues with like the manatees, I mean, if, this, if the agency had a little bit of resource to, you know, help work on some of the water quality issues, as well as some education um, with some of the boat strikes, right? I mean, it would have a transformative impact. I mean, same thing with some of the reef work and other things you're doing. And so, um, you know, we're pretty optimistic that it's a, it's a solution that's gonna work for localized problems in every part of the country and hopefully have a collaborative solution that strengthens the economy instead of a regulatory solution that obviously creates a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, really good points. Um, we also have another question from uh, John Eldon. Uh, we don't have the Nature Conservancy uh, on, they're not participating this morning, but he asked about the, the role of, um, uh, of purchasing of land purchases. And I know purchasing land can be somewhat controversial, um, uh, but um, you know, is that, do we know if, if Rawa and states are you know, going to continue to maybe purchase land for conservation or is it going to be mostly easements that we see, Sarah? What, from your perspective, what? Right, well, I think Brent, you hit it. We, we don't want to start out of the gate saying that you know, land acquisition, we have a land conservation strategy in Missouri where we've already established uh, those very clear top priorities for when we might purchase land. What are those high quality, uh, let's say a remnant, a prairie, those high quality habitats that for the good of the overall species and always uh, with a willing landowner, that's a key point, 
Mm -hmm. um, we, we would utilize uh, some for land acquisition, of course, conservation easements and, and other tools as well. But uh, it's, it's really after that analysis of those clear cri uh, criteria for really the, the um, highest valued properties. But it's great to have uh, additional resources for that purpose as well. Right, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, we, Melanie uh, Noble asks, um, you know, how she can help in Southeast Indiana. Um, there's going to be a lot of people who are unfamiliar with RAWA if this passes and um, opportunities for, for uh, uh, competitive grants and organizations to support this effort. Um, Colin, what, I mean, what, uh, obviously the bill has not passed yet. Uh, if, if somebody asks, what can they do to support it? I mean, what's, what's, what can be done kind of at this point of the game? getting off mute. Um, I mean, right now, I mean, uh, I, I think, frankly, I mean, the most important thing is just talking to your member of Congress. Um, so I'm not sure if you're in the in Congressman Pence's side of the line or Congressman Hollinsworth's side, side of the line down there in Southeast Indiana. Um, but, you know, letting them know that this is important, letting them know there's that there's a lot of species that are going to be, be saved. It's a way to help ensure a, um, a less regulatory future for agriculture in that part of the state. Um, you know, obviously, there's a, there's a whole bunch of species that without additional investment, you know, could wind up on the, on the endangered species list. You know, letting Senator Braun, who's been a great conservation champion on so many fronts, know that this is important. Letting Congressman Young, who's been one of the leading thinkers on international wildlife conservation issues, um, let him, letting them know that's important. But just frankly, just like just letting them know that's important. That's a nonpartisan, you know, it's arguably a, a you know fairly conservative solution in, in, in one way. Um, that it's a it's something that that you strongly support, and then ideally have your friends and families and other partner organizations do the same. The more, the merrier. Yeah, good suggestions there, Colin. Um, you know, one thing I'd throw out to the three of you, if you have any thoughts, um, obviously, uh, ecosystem services and, and banking um, markets uh, used to create banks for like wetland mitigation and species banking, you know, become increasingly popular in a way to, uh, to, to leverage greater investments and in, in partnerships uh, in, in species conservation and in conservation writ large. Um, do you see an opportunity for, for the increased funding to kind of facilitate and encourage more species banking? Amos, do you want to take that one? Well, I think, yes, you're going to see more uh, mitigation banks, species banking, but actually, and to go back to the previous question, I think the most important thing on the horizon is conservation easement law. Um, okay. You know, that was first passed by President Bush in 2006. It was made permanent under President uh, Obama in uh, 2016. And today you can do working agricultural easements with, for example, again, I gave uh, grants to start Cattlemen's Land Trust in California, Colorado, and Texas. That was 25 years ago. To those, today, those are the largest land trusts in their respective states. And easements today are an significant financial advantage for landowners. You've got a 15 year carry forward and a deductibility against all income. And so you can have a working farm and to go back to Leopold uh, and agriculture, uh, the best land is on, best wildlife habitat is on private land. Even in Western states, which are 50 to 80% public land, Private land is the most important habitat because it's where the water is. It's where the riparian areas are. So that's where the species are. So mm -hmm. I think the biggest tool in the future is going to be conservation easements and, and broader application of easements um, for preserving habitat. Yeah. So Brent, oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead there. I, I was going to add to that the market-based question too, because I think it's a, an incredibly important one. And we do have that mitigation banks that are relatively new to Missouri, but starting up. But, you know, I think of our, our grassland habitats, our most in, imperiled habitats here in Missouri are grasslands. And so we've really been, again, back to private landowners and how do we creatively partner with them? We've been uh, really promoting the, the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program for our cattle ranchers to convert fescue to native grasslands, which certainly helps our grassland bird species, but then you know, part of that program is then promoting bird friendly beef on the consumer end and uh, really helping uh, with partners, helping them identify a, a market on that end. And so that's really growing in popularity too. But to your point, I think we'll 
continue to see these innovative uh, market-based uh, efforts in development. Really good point. Early in, in my career, I spent uh, almost three years in Africa, and I learned a lot at the at the intellectual foot of David Western. In his book, In the Dust of Kilimanjaro, he asked the question, do you really think conservationists can save animals and ignore people? <laughs> the trouble with you biologists is you never consider economic and social factors. Again, to Sarah's point, uh, right. you've got to make people part of the conservation parade. It's not just about biology and science. People are the people that are, are, are the proponents that actually affect action on their lands. Yeah, ab absolutely. And Amos, that takes me back to college when graduating with my wildlife management degree. All my friends wanted to go out and, you know, be uh, park rangers and work in the forest. And I got called to DC because I felt, you know, um, one of the biggest challenges for managing wildlife is managing uh, human activities. And, and, you know, incentives are so critical. We, we've seen historically where government mandates seem to have, in many cases, have the opposite effect. And so getting the incentives right and collaboration and partnering, you know, are so critical in, in kind of, you know, um, getting people excited about, you know, doing a good thing. So well, um, even in saving species in the 70s and 80s, it was entrepreneurial nonprofits right. that helped recover uh, hooping cranes, California condor, peregrine right. falcon, bald eagle, etc. Well, our friend Alec Eccles, um, uh, as he often says about species, you know, and he's spent a lot of work in agriculture, he says we really have to turn species and, and endangered species from, from a liability into an asset and really encourage landowners and, and incentivize and provide safe harbors for landowners who actually want to, to uh, you know, expand critical habitat and, and, and provide it for, for those species. So, I mean, and, obviously the goal of RAWA is to keep species off the endangered species list uh, first and foremost, but you know, there, are, there are things that we can still, a lot of things we can do to, to re help recover those species. Uh, Robin, and, and, and I, had a, I had a great conversation. Ahead. I had a yep. great conversation one time with, with Chairman John Dingle um, you know, a few years before he passed. And he was the architect of the, of the Endangered Species Act, which you know, passed with you know, overwhelming, you know, 99% support across both both the caucuses. And he said his one regret was that the piece that was always was always promised but never, never they never got done was the the proactive funding piece. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know, I'd argue, I mean, and, and you know, we can have different opinions on the screen or across the, the attendees on the, the Endangered Species Act. I mean, it's a great success story in terms of keeping species from going extinct, but we've starved it, right? I mean, like we're not right. investing in recovery and we're not, and, like, and so it's all of a sudden in, 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 the, in the absence of investment, regulation becomes the, the tool that's available because it's, you know, doesn't require as much upfront money um, as, right. as a proactive investment. And then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're not in that asset frame as you're talking about, you're in that liability frame. Um, but, you know, for, for decades, right, we've I mean, been kind of in this, in this battle. And the only thing that's, I mean, the thing that's losing is species, right, is biodiversity that's losing as, you know, folks are fighting in the courts or, you know, fighting over, you know, reg revisions where there's just, there's a better way. And so what we're proposing as much as anything is a new model for how to have kind of conservation without conflict and more right. collaborative conservation as a way to bring back these species that we care about before it's too late. Yep, absolutely, Colin. And we know there's organizations that that spend a fair amount of time of, of litigating species uh, protection and, and, and recovery, and obviously they serve a role, but I think there is a recognition that a lot of the litigation and those efforts to go into litig litigating those cases uh, can, you know, we can put those money and efforts into, uh, you know, to recovering species and, you know, on the ground, boots on the ground work that actually is is uh, doing some real things. So, uh, um, you know, Robin Tyner um, um, has a question and, and uh, has, has raised the concern about herbicides and pesticides in, 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 in uh, agricultural practices. And if there's a way to uh, uh, perhaps use this moment to engage more farmers to, to uh, you know, revert to, to um, traditional practices um, that use less pesticides and herbicides. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not going to um, uh, be too critical of herbicides and pesticides because, as we know, without them, um, we we would be in a world of hurt in many cases. But it's it's a matter of balancing it and using them in the correct way. So, is there is there a way to? Do you think that there's an opportunity to to encourage more kind of traditional agricultural practices and move away from some of the uh, uh, the pesticides and herbicides that are creating public concern? 
Yes. Um, I mean, I have a conference call with the Farm Journal uh, day after tomorrow on this very subject. And how do you get the word out? Uh, again, I, and you also have technologies coming forward. I mean, they now have laser technology for, for weeding. Um, and there's just incredible innovation going on in the ag sector across the board. So I think this is very promising. It's a matter of harnessing it and taking it to scale. That's, that's great. Amos, do you know, is, is US, I assume that USDA is engaged in this conversation, you know, and, um, you know, hopefully they're working with, with the states, Sarah, with, with your, you know, your agency to kind of promote better practices and more sustainable practices long term. We but just USDA, had, a, go ahead, Sarah. I'll just say, mention, or quickly mention that we just had a, a workshop last week uh, on cover crops and had all of our permitty farmers, uh, you know, we uh, probably have, I don't know, 20 to 30,000 of our own acres that um, we, we contract with, uh, with ag producers, our permitty farmers. And so I think it starts with uh, state agencies, with land management agencies, um, applying best practices first on our, on our public lands. And so that is, we have been transitioning to uh, different contract conditions and uh, minimizing the use of pesticide, et cetera, maximizing use of cover crops. Um, and so really transitioning, because I think, again, let's, let's be the example, let's be the model first on public lands. I think that's a good place to start. Yeah. You know, yeah today, today, agriculture is the elephant in the room on, on species conservation. Uh, the Endangered Species Program at Fish and Wildlife Service is about 60 million. If you lump that with the Partners for Wildlife Program for their outreach, you get another 55 million. So you're, you're at about 100 million. But today, NRCS puts $4 billion on the ground in their Working Land for Wildlife Program. And FSA does the conservation easement. So there are more than 40 times the funding that Interior Department has, and Interior really has spent last, much of the last 20 years pursuing a regulatory approach. So mm -hmm. agriculture is absolutely uh, critical to moving forward on species recovery and pre-listing species. Yeah, really good point, Amos. So Colin, question for you. Uh, obviously, as we see uh, 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 legislative agenda of the, the administration, you know, bogged down right now, um, you know, what is, does Rawa have a realistic chance of passing this year? I mean, if you're looking at, obviously there's no guarantees, but if you look into your crystal ball, what do you, what do you, what do you see down the road here? Yeah, look, I, I'm incredibly optimistic. And, and the reason is that, you know, I mean, the, the magic number in the Senate is 60, um, you know, so to already have, you know, 14 Republicans, 14 Democrats, you know, assuming, um, that's indicative of broader support across the caucuses. I think that's a great sign. No, I mean, there's, there's questions and we'll have to work through that. It's, you know, the legislative process, which all of us have spent a lot of time in over the years. But, you know, anytime that, you know, something kind of transcends politics um, across the left and right, where you get, yep. you know, progressives and arch conservatives all, you know, all you know, singing off the same hymnal. Um, it's a yep. pretty special thing. We don't see it often enough, right? I think we saw a lot more yeah. in the previous I tell you, It's heartwarming. It really is. Yeah. I think, I think America needs more, more of this. Yeah. And, and, and look, and I, and I think, you know, for folks that are, are on the line, you know, thinking about whether they're, if they, if they work in a congressional office or they're, you know, thinking about calling, I mean, just look at the, the character, the, quali the quality of the character of the people that are, that are leading the bill, right? I mean, Roy Blunt's one of the greatest statesmen in the, in the U.S. Senate, right? Martin Heinrich, you know, has emerged as one of the leading conservation champions. I mean, Angus King is incredibly thoughtful. I mean, I mean, just like, like the folks that were, I mean, John Bozeman, right? It's just done, you know, it's just done magnificent work for common sense agric agriculture policy and wetland conservation. I mean, these are all folks that, um, you know, a lot of workhorses, right? These are folks that, you know, do the work that, you know, they're not flashy, they're not going to show up every day on, you know, Twitter feeds, but they're, you know, they're, they're doing the work. And, and I just think um, folks should take heart in that. Um, and yeah. same thing on the, on the, on the House side. I mean, you got, you know, the leaders of the Congressional Sportsman Caucus, you know, folks like, like Richard Hudson in North Carolina and Austin Scott in Georgia. And, you know, in addition to Congressman Fortenberry, of course, and, you know, and, and, you know, like guys, like guys, like Congressman Whitman. I mean, like they're these are these are folks that no one would you know confuse for being you know liberals <laughs> in any case. And at the same time, you see fairly progressive members like you know Chairman Grijalva and others. And so I think we 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 found something here, right? Like we found something that's uniting, um, right. and that's why I'm optimistic because you know the House markup will occur. Um, it's it's going to be in a few weeks. It looks like it had, there was a okay. just, the agenda got too full. 
Okay. Um, but there's um, but the, that level of bipartisan support. I mean, on EPW, um, so the Committee of Jurisdiction in the Senate is the Environment and Public Works Committee. Chairman Capito, Chair, uh, Chairman Carper, uh, Ranking Member Capito um, have both, you know, been, uh, had a lot of interest in, in the bill, learning more. I mean, hopefully they'll, they'll both get on the bill. Um, but you already have four or five Republicans on the committee and you already have five Democrats on the committee. Um, that's, you know, half the members of the committee already on and we're, you know, looking, yeah, for, a, looking for a hearing hopefully in, you know, late November, early December. So, um, like, I mean, nothing's guaranteed in DC, but, you know, the things that get done, you know, outside of reconciliation, the things that get done are things that have that level of bipartisan support they can move on the floor. And, right. you know, because of the great champions we have, we, we have that right now. Yeah, no, that's right. And so, um, yeah, Colin, I don't have the, the bill numbers in front of me, but um, uh, somebody's, if somebody wants to call their, their congresswoman or congress uh, person, uh, who, this is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act for those that, uh, you know, are, are, are new to the, to the issue. Um, it, the name of the bill is the same in the Senate and the House, but uh, different, I see different bill numbers. Yeah, so in the Senate, it's um, Senate Bill 2372. The numbers are so shockingly close. So 2372 in the House and then 2773 in the 2773 in the in the House. So that's the, the two numbers. I'll put them in the chat so folks okay. can see them. But okay. you know, just I mean, just let folks know that you're that you're supportive, that you think it's good for the, you know, good for wildlife, but it's also good for the economy. And that's uh it's the best thing. And like and I'll just use one quick example that you know, I think Sarah and Amos have heard me use before. You know, where we invest, we we do incredible things, right? I mean, recovery of deer and turkeys and ducks and you know, I mean, we've, we've had these great successes, um, you know, and the, the investments that Amos made when he was, when he was leading the charge, um, you know, in individual species, you know, bald eagles, con California condors. I mean, there, there's all these amazing examples. I mean, there's no better example, frankly, than, than ducks, um, the waterfowl investment. So right. you know, the duck stamp was created in 1935. NACA is created about 30 years ago, the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. Um, over the last 50 years, as bird populations have gone down by 3 billion um, or, you know, 29% decrease, Duck population, waterfowl populations have gone up by fifty six percent. Wow! At the same period, you know, uh, grassland bird populations that Amos was talking about in the grasslands and the prairies have gone down by fifty three percent because we haven't made the same kind of dedicated investment. Exactly. So like, this isn't theory, right? This is very like if we invest, we will save species. We will reduce, yeah. you know, we will increase the collaboration. We reduce the need for some of the regulation, and we'll say bring back species that are already, you know, pretty far towards the brink. So it's a, um, it's pretty special when you can talk across party lines and. Nothing I just said in that paragraph, right, is, is yeah. partisan, right? It's just good investments and good common sense and government at its best, frankly. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, protecting wildlife and, and bi uh, biodiversity isn't a partisan issue, but uh, and hopefully we can continue to promote it across the, the political aisle. Sarah Namus, uh, any closing thoughts, remarks from you? Yeah, well, I just... I, yeah. No, Amos, you go. Um, emphasize again the importance of conservation easements. Um, Brent, you and I are both in Maine. In 2000 to 2004, I did, did two easements in Maine that protected 1.1 million acres of forest wow. habitat. That's one third of all the conservation land in Maine at a very cheap effort. And I think um, uh, engaging people across the board um, is the way forward. Um, Again, David Western in Africa said, for wildlife to survive in independent Africa, it must become an asset to the African. Exactly. And wildlife is one of our greatest assets in this country. It's appreciated by everyone. Um, we need to invest, as Colin said, and get ahead of the curve in protecting species. Yep, well, well stated. Sarah, we'll give you the last word. Well, just a, a huge thank you, and I think, uh, uh, Brent or Amos, you mentioned at the beginning, we wouldn't be to this point without, without Colin and his leadership. And so I want to personally yeah. thank him for what he's done to get us here. But, you know, it, it, it is just this moment in time. Uh, you've, heard, you've heard of the crisis. You've heard of the need. Uh, states are prepared and ready. Um, but states have been moving towards more landscape level uh, regional collaborative conservation over the last, certainly over the last half dozen years or longer. And uh, we are all looking uh, for better ways to leverage uh, our finite resources to protect these, these at-risk species. Um, so there's good movement happening across state boundaries at the regional level that really is just going to feed in. When RABWA passes, uh, I think we're gonna even make greater difference because of these relationships that have been building over this last period of time. Well, this is, that's, that's, that's great. And I think we can all be encouraged and 
uh, cheer for the passage of, uh, of uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act and, and doing something uh, great as a nation. So uh, coming together. I wanna thank uh, the three of you again for your incredible leadership um, on these issues historically and, and, and now and appreciate uh, you sharing your time this morning with us to, to educate us a little bit more about, about these issues and the opportunities that, uh, that are presented. So thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. Thank you.